So Madhu, uh, when did you first hear about AIME and Iron and Steel Society? Oh, um, I first heard about AIME while I was still in graduate school. Uh, it was 1976 and uh, uh, my professor took a group of students to the uh, annual meeting, which was in Las Vegas. And we thought as students, that's fantastic. <laughs> it was a bicentennial year. So I remember breakfast was 76 cents. <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was really fascinating. You know, I, I found it uh, terrific that you could go to a conference and you had industry experts, academics, uh, share their knowledge so freely. There was so much to learn. You know, I kept on jumping from one session to the next. Uh, and uh, then in the evening, we would go out on the strip and uh, enjoy the sights mm -hmm. and sounds. And uh, it was fun. And how, how did you pa end up participating in these organizations over the years? Well, let's see. I've been a member of the uh, what was then Iron and Steel Society and now AIST since uh, 1978. Uh, early in my career when I was uh, uh, actually truly a metallurgist, now I'm far away from it. <laughs> uh, but during that time... Uh, I did present uh, some papers, also joined the iron making uh, program committee to develop the uh, program for the annual conference. Uh, I also served as a president of the uh, Midwest uh, Steelmakers chapter. And uh, along with Iron and Steel Society, uh, I was also fortunate to uh, attend some conferences in Europe as well as uh, Japan. Uh, later on, I encouraged my team members to participate in the AIST meetings, uh, conferences, uh, serve on committees, because it's a great networking uh, opportunities. Uh, on the other side, as a part of operations, uh, I was also a member of the AISI's operating committee. So uh, on uh, one hand, I was meeting uh, great uh, researchers, uh, uh, great professors, you know, Waikau Lu, Keith Brimacombe, Gordon Lyons, uh, Brian Thomas, Dick Fruan, Alan Cram, just to name a few. And then in the operating committee, you know, I was meeting uh, uh, very well-known uh, operators and uh, researchers that were applied researchers, you know, like uh, Fred Rorick, uh, Dale Hines, uh, uh, Joe Poromo. Uh, it was very, uh, very energizing. And uh, uh, I, I, throughout my career, I always encourage people uh, that work in the steel plant, whether they are engineers or operators or workers, uh, to become part of this uh, uh, big international uh, uh, organization, uh, because it really helps you. It opens your eyes. So, you, uh, so what would you say are the benefits? I mean, you have been an active member of uh, ISS and AIST over the period of time. So what do you think are the most important benefits of being an active member? Oh, there are so many. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, it's a great networking opportunities. Uh, you get to know what's going on in your field. Uh, you meet suppliers, uh, uh, you hear about the latest technology, uh, you can get to size up your competition as well and uh, learn what's going on in the industry. Uh, the biggest thing my, in my mind is you are able to also give back to the profession uh, by making presentations and just networking. Uh, and most importantly, uh, you don't become obsolete. You don't become relic of the past because you're always keeping up with what's going on in the industry.
So early in your career, you were part of Inland Steel and it was taken over in 1998 by Mr. Mithil and then Mithil Steel took over the International Steel Group in 2004. So what was your experience uh, through all these changes and acquisitions? Uh, initially it was tough, uh, but it turned out to be a valuable uh, experience. Uh, uh, I learned so much. Uh, uh, Mr. Mittal gave me the opportunity to be part of his uh, due diligence teams for acquisitions. And so this enabled me to uh, uh, travel all over the world and visit different plants uh, and to uh, learn from them, uh, as well as when, when those mills were acquired to help them improve their efficiency. So I had the opportunity to travel to Germany, France, South Africa, as well as some distant places like Kazakhstan, Slovakia, Romania, yeah. Turkey, Poland, uh, just uh, a steel mills in uh, places you would never think you are going to go and be able to uh, visit. Uh, being part of the Mittal organization allows you to learn a lot about the financial side of the business, which was uh, valuable later on uh, in my career. And then when ISG was acquired, uh, being part of the ISG also helped because uh, most of the people in I, uh, ISG knew me before because we were colleagues in the ASD program committees or meetings. So uh, it was fairly uh, uh, easy to uh, achieve the integration and achieve the synergies that were expected on hard side of the business. So people from ISG like Eric Hagi, Gary Norgren, uh, Tom Russo, Dale, Dale Hines and Terry Fedor, uh, they accepted me pretty readily because they knew me as a colleague and a professional. So it was uh, being part of the ASD help there uh, and I learned a lot from the Mittal organization on financial side of the business. So after traveling uh, all over the world uh, uh, with acquisitions and stuff, uh, you decided to uh, you know, stay back and settle down as plan managers for two to big integrated steel facilities, you know, Burns Harbor and Indiana Harbor. How was, how was your experience over there? Uh, <laughs> it was very humbling experience. Uh, these are large plants, you know, where you have many people working in there and you quickly find out that, hey, uh, you're not gonna be able to know all the employees. You're not gonna be able to know all the processes or products or customers. So uh, it really brings home the importance of building a really strong team and then trusting them to do their job. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, uh, uh, you, you can set the direction, uh, you can develop a game plan, but then you have to let your team execute that game plan because that game plan is going to change. Uh, as the situation develops and they are the best judge of making adjustments as you go along. As long as everybody is working for the same goals, uh, you can achieve what is the objective. And on the personal side, uh, being general manager of these plants, you know, I also felt uh, a lot of responsibility to the employees. You know, I felt these employees and their families are relying on me uh, for their livelihood, for making uh, this plant continue and provide them with the uh, employment. So uh, safety was always at the top of the mind. You know, everyone has to go back home safely. And uh, you had to keep on thinking about ways to improve uh, become customer preferred 
and have operations that will remain profitable throughout the cycle. So you didn't have to lay anybody off. And they were able to, you know, keep up with their family needs. I, I, I always felt, you know, that apart from everything in the plant, you know, you have these a large number of people really uh, relying on you to steer the ship in the right direction. So two big plants and uh, so many employees and uh, they were all union employees. So how was it working with uh, union groups? Yeah, the unions are different for each plant. So you cannot really generalize. The union at Indiana Harbor was different from union at Bones Harbor. Uh, but one thing I always felt uh, was that 98, 99% of people who come to work, uh, they want to do a good, honest job and go back home safely to their families. Now, when you have plants that have 4,000, 5,000 people, uh, there are always one to 2% who are exceptions. And those one to 2% take most of the time of the union leadership as well as management. And I felt my job was to really focus on those 98, 99% of people who were ready to come to work, do an honest day's job and do well. Uh, but I couldn't let those one to 2% of exceptions really affect the morale of rest of the group. So those things had to be uh, taken care of. Uh, but you cannot spend too much time on those one to 2%. You have to spend majority of the time on those 98, 99% of good employees. Uh, working in a union environment, I always felt that it is time to discard old labels that are used for union officials. Uh, for example, historically, the lead department union official is called as a griever. And that has such a negative connotation for everyone right from the start. And that history shapes a lot of union management uh, relations in the plant. Uh, at Woods Harbor, it took a lot of time in the 2009, 2010 recession to convince the union that work practices had to be modernized. Uh, things had to change as the business dwindled to 40% of normal. Once they understood the depth of the recession and that there was no better option, uh, the union came to party and they were very cooperative and helped change the work practices, change the bonus plans. Uh, later on, we jointly developed a, uh, uh, a training for maintenance workers, which were retiring, uh, and also work with the community colleges to have that training program. Uh, the union management relationship improved as uh, commonality of goals was uh, understood, and that really helped Bones Harbor achieve uh, record results in 2012 but it wasn't an easy process. Um, it's something I think uh, you learn a lot, but ultimately you have to know that they are all people and their families have the same goals and aspirations. It just, you have to make sure you don't let those one to 2% exceptions, those bad apples spoil the whole barrel. So you said that the 2012 was a profitable year, I know, after, after all these struggles in the recession times of 2009, 2010. So after that, what made you move to a new role with Cerastal uh, North America in 2013? Mm, yeah, uh, Cerastal came in with a very, very interesting uh, proposition. You know, they said they have this uh, brand new minimal that is fully operational, uh, but 
not profitable. So my challenge would be to make that mill profitable and make that quickly. Also for me, after running a 5 million ton operation at Burns Harbor for uh, nearly seven years, it was a time for change for me as well as for the plant as well. So they could have some fresh ideas come in. I had a strong leadership team in place. Uh, the talent pipeline was good. And uh, we had come successfully through the deep recession. And in fact, 2012 was a record year uh, until at least that time for Bones Harbor. So I felt comfortable in moving to Columbus on one hand, knowing that this is a challenge that's going to really energize me again. And on the other hand, Burns Harbor would do just fine with the leadership team that was in place and the systems that were developed and applied in the plant. So you were, you were managing uh, two steel mills, uh, integrated plants. Uh, the process of a mini mill is completely different. Uh, so how was, how was that change like? Uh, it, it was fun. It was fun. It was highly energizing. Uh, the mill had some cost issues. Yes, some quality issues. And not all departments were working together. Uh, however, I noticed that the employees are terrific. Uh, they all wanted to do what is the right thing to do for the plant. And the workforce is conscientious. They're well-educated. Uh, and they work hard. Uh, most importantly, they really cared. Uh, they cared for each other and they cared for success of the mill. You know, if you went to them with something they could do better or ask them, you know, how could you do this better? Or they would come up with ideas and they would make it happen. They would have to make it happen very quickly. Uh, I, I love working with them. Uh, so after I kind of oriented myself to the operations and I, I, I believe each plant is different. So you cannot do the same things you did in one plant in the other plant. You had to look at what the needs are, what the people are, and then figure out, you know, what's the uh, right approach to uh, proceed further. So. We spent some time working together with the leadership team, uh, you know, trying to find out, you know, what are the problems, what can be done better. Once we had the common purpose, you know, we were able to fix the cost issues and uh, uh, insist on quality production. Uh, the market was also improving and we developed the right products for that market. So in a few quarters, things really turned around and uh, it was a success that was earned by everybody at Columbus. Now coming to personal side, Madhu, uh, I mean, you, you were living in Chicago for a, quite a few, few years now. Uh, you, you, have, you had a family, but then uh, moving to Columbus, Mississippi, from Chicago, how was that transition? Yeah, uh, actually I was living in Northwest Indiana. It's about 45 minutes from Chicago, but it's a suburban environment. Uh, I came to uh, uh, Columbus in uh, Mississippi. People in Columbus are very friendly. In fact, it is known as the friendly city. <laughs> uh, and it's really true. And although I look different, I speak with a different accent, uh, they welcomed me warmly. You know, the local leadership invited me to join the uh, Golden Triangle Development Trust. Uh, I was also asked to join the uh, local community college advisory board, uh, also the Rotary Club. Uh, my wife got to know uh, some ladies in the mill as well as in town and developed close uh, friendship. So I, I enjoyed living in Columbus and didn't miss the snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, for sure, I can understand that. So uh, in 2014, uh, Steel Dynamics uh, acquired uh, Severstal North America. So how was another transition for you? So how was that transition like? Uh, it came as a surprise, you know, when I took the job at Columbus, uh, I never thought that the owners of the Columbus operation were going to sell it so quickly. But for whatever reason, that was the uh, decision. And uh, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty among the workforce. Uh, fortunately, I had some experience in acquisitions uh, by being in the other side, the side of the acquirer from uh, Mittal Steel and uh, later on uh, ArcelorMittal. So I thought I could help. And um, uh, Columbus team navigated through that very well uh, through the concerning time period. And when SDI was successful in acquiring Columbus, that's the best thing that has happened to uh, uh, this plant and all employees, including me. Uh, SDI brought a, uh, uh, a really good compensation system, uh, which ties uh, everybody's uh, motivation together. You know, you not only have bonuses, but you also have uh, stock that is given and profit sharing that is given to each and every employee in the plant. So it's not restricted only to top management, which is very, very unusual in the business. So that's why everybody is willing to try new things and also help each other. Uh, for the plant, help is available uh, whenever you need it, either from other plants or from uh, corporate, but largely uh, you run your own business. Uh, of course, capital investment and sales are coordinated, uh, but it's basically a highly decentralized organization. In the plant itself, there are only three management levels and there is no corporate bureaucracy that can uh, take up your uh, time unnecessarily. Also, SDI is very solid financially, so it can afford investments in the mill, in the people, in the customers, and uh, communities. Uh, in 2018, uh, we at Columbus, the team developed a series of interwoven projects uh, to go with the company strategy to move Columbus to more uh, enriched product mix with more value added products. Uh, we called it Vision 2020. And it's almost complete now. And as our CEO, uh, Mark Millett uh, mentions, you know, it's going to uh, result in higher highs as well as higher lows in the business cycle for uh, Columbus, making the plant always solidly profitable. Okay. So like after nearly eight years of Columbus, uh, in Columbus as a, a general manager and vice president, uh, you're moving into a new role now. Uh, can you, can you like first uh, tell about any recognitions you received in the industry, like over over your, over the period of time you have been in steel industry? Oh, so, uh, yeah. Again, early in my career, you know, I was uh, honored to receive uh, peer recognition in the form of uh, uh, J. Johnson Award as well as uh, T. L. Joseph Award from the Iron and Steel Society. On the outside, I was also quite active uh, in American Heart Association um, for their fundraising uh, program. I was the executive director for uh, uh, industry in Northwest Indiana. 
have also served on the board for the WIC program in Hammond. Uh, but in terms of recognition, uh, uh, my professional satisfaction really comes from the team's successes. Uh, when ideas are not just ideas, but they are implemented and they get results and people benefit from it, customers benefit from it, shareholders benefit from it. Uh, it is that, you know, there are events early in my career like flux pellets, pole injection uh, at the big furnace uh, exceeding 10,000 tons per day, uh, increasing throughput and reducing scrap at Bulge Harbor. Believe it or not, at one point, uh, that plant used to be proud that they never purchased scrap from outside because there was enough scrap generated internally. Okay. And I just didn't think that was right. Yeah. So that, that got fixed as again, people understood what was happening and what was the impact of it. The scrap reduction effort, yield improvement effort uh, helped there. Uh, development of high strength products from the uh, chittle line there or uh, uh, transition of Columbus to more value added products and being a very profitable plant in the stable of steel dynamics. Uh, those are the things uh, that the team does. Uh, while I'm here, uh, I, I get more satisfaction from those. So now your new role, uh, you would be general manager for raw materials supply and strategy. So can you elaborate what, what are you going to do now in this new role? Yeah, I mean, moving from Columbus is uh, bare sweet. I really love the plant. I really love the people here. So it's going to be uh, difficult, but I'm also excited about this uh, uh, new, new direction. Uh, in this new role, uh, we'll be evaluating and securing raw materials for uh, uh, Columbus, as well as the new plant that is being built in Sinton, and also to some extent for uh, Butler. With this uh, pig iron and hot briquetted iron uh, amongst the three plant, it's going to be a $1 billion a year business. So it's going to be very important from cost perspective as well as being able to make uh, uh, high quality products by reducing uh, impurities that come in through scrap. So it's, it's, it's got to be done right technically, uh, operationally, uh, logistically and commercially. So uh, I have people like uh, Kamlesh Mandal and Sanjeev Badola who are really experts in their area. And so it's going to be uh, fabulous. And uh, I will also help uh, uh, all the plants uh, in a variety of ways, you know, using what I've learned in my 43 years in the industry so far. So uh, it's going to be uh, a pretty active uh, uh, task. Overall, 43 years in the industry. Uh, how was your family life during your professional career, Madhu? Uh, yeah, I met my wife in Chicago. She's from Boston. After getting to know each other for about a year, uh, we got married. Again, my mom supported me. Uh, and Karen is a very strong uh, support for me throughout my career. You know, without her, uh, I would not have been able to devote as much time uh, as I did to uh, work and as much energy I uh, used in the business side of things. Uh, we have uh, two kids. Uh, they are married now. And uh, both are smart, or at least I think they are smart. Uh, they're caring and have done uh, very well in their uh, uh, careers. Uh, when they were growing up, I did always make time 
to uh, attend their ball games, uh, their plays, their graduations, uh, and other activities they were uh, involved in. And we were able to uh, take uh, vacations, you know, travel in the US as well as uh, travel uh, abroad. So uh, I hope uh, both Brian and Erica think uh, they have had a, a good childhood. Uh, coming back to uh, Karen, uh, how was it like uh, we are we are from Indian uh, society, Indian heritage, uh, and we go with this arranged marriage situation most of the time. So how was it convincing your mom, Madhu, during that time? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, typically, uh, uh, you know, parents have a big role to play in India on the selection of partners for their uh, offsprings. And uh, my mom started in that fashion uh, too. You know, in fact, uh, when she came to US in 1978, you know, she had uh, uh, a portfolio of <laughs> uh, girls who she had pre-screened for uh, uh, seeing if I was interested in any of them. But by that time I had met Karen I introduced Karen to my mom and uh, they liked each other. Uh, they got to know each other much better. In fact, uh, we had a road trip to visit one of my friends in uh, Buffalo, New York. And I remember there was, I think, five of us traveling in a car. So uh, on that long trip, uh, you get to know each other uh, quite well. And uh, Karen likes interacting with uh, different cultures uh, she she really immediately take took liking to my uh, sister and in fact uh, karen uh, is a social worker she used to be a social worker at that time and my sister liked it so much that she followed her footsteps and got her msw degree in india and uh, work and recently now she has started her uh, uh, own firm, uh, helping people with uh, adoptions. So it, it all worked out, but um, uh, yes, it was uh, off the beaten path, so as to say. Like if you look back into your all 43 years of illustrious career, is there anything you, you, you think you wanted to do differently or change anything? I don't think I will change anything. I mean, I don't have any regrets. Uh, I mean, I, I am very happy with how my life has turned out, how my family's life has turned out. Uh, I feel I've been able to help uh, people at Indiana Harbor, at Bunch Harbor, at Columbus. Um, it's been uh, very rewarding in that fashion. Uh, sometimes I do wonder about, you know, uh, what some of the things we work on and they didn't go forward for whatever reason, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things we had uh, worked on uh, uh, when I was at Inland Steel uh, was a project for replacing coke ovens and blast furnaces that were very old and as well as uh, BOF vessels with uh, two DC electric furnaces, which were going to use some hot metal from, uh, or pig iron, liquid pig iron from number seven blast furnace, as well as uh, use some uh, DRI and HBI from uh, Mr. Mittal's plant in Mexico and then use scrap and balance between the three based on the uh, cost side and the product needs side. Uh, but that didn't go forward because of dot-com bus, the economy tanked and the timing just wasn't right. Uh, we had also looked at building a third galvanizing line for the joint venture uh, with uh, Nippon Steel. And again, that didn't come to uh, pass. Uh, in Bones Harbor, uh, we had developed a series of integrated 
projects. Uh, we called it the footprint. Uh, again, because of uh, the financial situation, uh, it, they weren't able to go forward. But then when I look at Columbus, you know, all those three things have happened. We have two electric furnaces that are uh, running uh, with a mix of pig iron with HBI and scrap. Uh, uh, we have built a third galvanizing line just mm -hmm. recently. And uh, we completed this whole strategy to take Columbus to uh, more upmarket with more value added products. And Columbus is set up pretty well. So uh, I don't know how those things would have turned out if they had happened at that time, but I, I kind of got a second chance <laughs> with that. Okay, uh, moving on now. Uh, what would be your advice to engineering students? And uh, how about those who recently joined the steel industry? Oh boy. Uh, again, I mean, I can, I can share what my thoughts are, but each person is unique and uh, different things work for different people. So there is no one single recipe. Everybody has to find out, you know, what works best for them, find their own way, so as to speak. Uh, but just in terms of what I learned, uh, I would say for the students, uh, uh, learn not only what's in your field, but take classes in other disciplines as well. Uh, if you're studying metallurgical engineering, uh, learn something about mechanical or chemical engineering. Uh, learn about personal finance, also subject in humanities. That will really bring uh, a deeper understanding of how things come together. Uh, if you are training to become an industrial mechanic, you know, uh, learn a bit about what electricians do, what automation technicians do, and definitely, definitely sign up for internship or a co-op program. Uh, what would be your advice to managers or newly promoted managers? Uh, newly promoted managers, uh, I would say you are there to make your team successful. Uh, it's not about you. It's about what the team is going to make happen for the company, for the shareholders, and all the stakeholders in the plant. So... Uh, surround yourself with smart people uh, and be accessible and available to your uh, team members. Uh, you can accomplish a lot by asking people rather than ordering them around. Uh, let your team use their own creativity and innovation. You can give them guidance, you can give them direction, you can work out a strategy, but let them contribute to it. Let them design the nuts and bolts details of it. Uh, if they come up with an idea, don't tweak it too much because then it will no longer be their own idea. You know, if somebody thinks it's their own idea, they are going to move mountains to make it successful. So if you think it has a pretty good chance, let them go at it, you know, and you will be amazed the type of results people can uh, accomplish. Uh, also, you know, help and uh, mentor others. Uh, learn other facets of the business, you know, not just your own operation, but learn about what finance does, what sales does, what logistics does to broaden your horizons. And that's what will prepare you for moving up in your career. And when you are in management, you also have to look outside of your plan, you know, look at the community, look at your profession, you know, what can you give back? Execute your day-to-day -day work well, uh, but also think about future, plan ahead, 
for your team. So they will always be prepared and they will be surprised uh, when something comes along. Uh, that will make your company successful for tomorrow. So the big thing to realize is, you know, when you are a manager, uh, you are really a leader. Uh, you're not ordering people around, you're setting direction, but you're letting people do their thing. You're going to train them, you're going to provide them the right tools, right processes, but then let them lose. Make them lose, let them do their thing. And if there are any issues, you deal with them. But you will you'll be surprised how well people uh, do when they have uh, uh, that empowerment and they really become engaged in the business. That's, that's, that's good, uh, good to know. Uh, is there anything else you would like to discuss, Madhu? Uh, I, I feel incredibly lucky and privileged to have the experiences I have had so far, you know, and I, uh, I, I just, Oh, uh, everything to my mom and uh, her name is Shalini uh, for constantly supporting me uh, despite the hardships she had to uh, endure. And also to my wife, Karen, you know, who uh, stood st steadfastly by me and took a major role in raising our children uh, I owe a lot to my education in IIT in UC Berkeley, which opened the doors for me. My friends who helped me at a crucial juncture in my life. And uh, I have learned tremendously from every manager I work for. And I'm grateful to Mr. Mittal, Mr. Mordashav, and Mr. Millet. Surprisingly, I think M is kind of a lucky letter for Madhu. <laughs> uh, uh, to my teams at Indiana Harbor, Bones Harbor, and uh, Columbus, who uh, always went above and uh, beyond. And also to AIST and AISI and other organizations, including the local community organizations, uh, who who helped me uh, by sharing their knowledge, their expect expertise, and providing uh, a fresh perspective, which I wasn't necessarily aware of. You know, going forward, I'll continue to contribute to the company and to the profession and the people. Uh, work is not really work. It is always invigorating and real fun. You've certainly had an interesting life and uh, I'm really privileged and I really had the, I enjoyed and I had the pleasure uh, to interview you. And uh, many thanks again for sharing your background, your uh, life stories from your childhood, your accomplishments uh, with AIME for its oral history program. Thank, thanks a lot, Madhu. Thank you, Nikhil. And thank you, Michelle.